I want you to hit me as hard as you can. He's been called almost everything. Merciless, a mad scientist, a Nazi asshole, even everything that is wrong with Hollywood. Yet Michael Bay has always kept coming back with hit after hit. He's a director with his own distinct style that some might call excessive. While film enthusiasts around the globe analyze the Art Nouveau style of Wes Anderson or the Baroque quiet of Federico Fellini, other people just want to watch stuff get blown up real good. Coming off his first five consecutive financial hits that accumulated nearly $2 billion in worldwide grosses, Michael Bay could essentially pick whatever project he wanted next. What do you want? What do you want? And what he selected was... The I... The Island. This summer. But when this movie arrived on screens in the summer of 2005, it was met with a resounding thud. Why did this seemingly surefire hit stumble so badly? Get your organs ready as we find out what the fuck happened to this movie. When Michael Bay was just a kid, he took his mother's 8mm camera, a toy train, and some firecrackers, and filmed his first explosion, resulting in a fire department call for a scorched bedroom. At age 15, he interned for George Lucas, and was in charge of filing storyboards for Raiders of the Lost Ark, the film he credits for truly igniting his passion to become a director. Bay attended Wesleyan College in Connecticut, where he and future producing partner Brad Fuller quickly realized they didn't quite fit in with the other film majors. They appreciated more mainstream movies, which their fellow students saw as a lesser form of entertainment. You filthy little mob blood. After graduating, Bay found work directing music videos for artists like Meatloaf and Aerosmith, along with the infamous Divinal song, I Touch Myself. As a commercial director, Bay would create the first ever Got Milk advertisement and would win acclaim for his work, including a Director's Guild of America award. These early accolades put him on the radar of Uber producer Jerry Bruckheimer and his partner Don Simpson. The pair hired Bay for the Will Smith, Martin Lawrence, buddy cop flick, Bad Boys, for which Bay only made a reported $125,000. He actually gave back $25,000 to Sony. Do you think of how much? To pay for a shot he desperately wanted for the finale, which is Michael Bay in a nutshell. The shots matter more than the money. Although, on future films, Bay would wisely choose to decline an upfront fee in exchange for lucrative back-end deals, which have netted him over $50 million on certain films. After Bad Boys 2 was released in 2003, Bay wanted to take a bit of time to determine his next project. One day, the phone rang, and on the other end was Steven Spielberg. The Hollywood heavyweight told Bay he was a very talented filmmaker. Spielberg had just received an excellent script that he thought was perfect for Bay, but it was time sensitive and he needed an answer by the next day or it would go out to the town. Bay finished reading the script at 3.30 in the morning and he was in. The Island would be his next film. Now, here's where things get interesting. For starters, Spielberg had previously developed an unmade Tom Cruise project based on Michael Marshall Smith's novel Spares, about a facility where human clones are bred for organ donation and a security guard who assists in the escape of several clones. With such a similar sounding premise, it seems odd that Spielberg wouldn't just grab the island for his own to-do pile for whenever his schedule cleared. But there's more to it. Allegedly, one of the other projects Bay was potentially being considered for at the time was an adaptation of The Tripods, a series of novels about an attack by giant three-legged extraterrestrial machines. Obviously, this familiar concept could have conceivably been competition for Spielberg's own War of the Worlds project he was then still developing. And so the rumor is that Spielberg essentially Jedi mind-tricked Bay into making the island, thus allowing himself to concentrate on his own alien invasion movie unopposed. Understandably, Bay was not pleased to learn about this tactic, especially when the island became a box office stiff, while War of the Worlds made $600 million that same summer. One for you and one two for me. And so, Transformers was supposedly an olive branch to Bay from Spielberg. Anyway, whether or not there's any truth to that story, Bay did eventually discover that his longtime producer, Jerry Bruckheimer, had initially turned down the script for the island himself. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, the two haven't made a film together since. The original draft of The Island was set 100 years in the future, but due to budgetary reasons, and to make the story feel more relevant, they settled on a closer dystopian future, which is actually now our past, the year 2019. The movie follows a group of people living in a sterile underground facility, safe from the contaminated air outside while they await a chance to go repopulate the pathogen-free zone of the title. 
Two of these residents discover this miraculous destination is just a lie, and they are actually clones created to have their body parts harvested for wealthy genetic sponsors. When she received the script, Scarlett Johansson was making the drama Match Point and was looking for a change in the roles she was taking. She immediately signed up for a chance to work with Michael Bay, saying she wanted to do a big-budget action movie, and Bay was one of the few directors who can do them right. Of course, just a few years later, Johansson would be an action movie regular. Her clone character was also originally written as pregnant and an asthmatic, so clearly that was changed to better suit her action debut. Hello there. For her clone partner, Bay chose Ewan McGregor for what he describes as his boyish wonderment, comparing him to Nicolas Cage. The decision to make McGregor's human counterpart a boat designer was inspired by Bay receiving yacht brochures in the mail. Even though he had no desire to ever purchase a yacht, he found the designs to be beautiful. The island had a relatively short span from when it was greenlit to the moment cameras began rolling in October 2004. With a firm release date set for July 2005, there wasn't a lot of time for pre-production. This actually suited Bay's approach as he likes to improvise shots during filming. When he steps on set, he wants to start rolling immediately, and his run-and-gun philosophy results in as many as 40 shots a day. Cinematographer Mauro Fiori said that sometimes Bay would give them just five minutes notice to rearrange the cameras and lights to accommodate his impulses. While storyboards and pre-visualizations were made for complex sequences, the cast and crew quickly learned that the Bay style of making a movie is to always be shooting. As Johansson commented, I don't know when he eats, when he sleeps, or when he goes to the bathroom, he never takes a break. Despite Bay's improvisational methods, the extravagant stunts were planned and performed with safety as the priority. But for some, the production was still pretty dangerous, particularly for scenes involving the high-speed jet bikes. Scarlett Johansson said she almost lost an eye shooting the sequence, while McGregor claimed the rig was the source of serious testicular abuse, stating, I thank my lucky stars I already have two children. And an extra was almost seriously injured when the heroes crashed through an office building and he failed to dodge the oncoming vehicle. Even Michael Bay himself was not safe from near-death experiences on the set. In another scene with the flying motorcycle, Bay was getting a low-angle shot when the crew began screaming and motioning for the director to move, and he narrowly dodged a speeding support pole before it took his head off. Without the crew's warning, the island would have been the very last Michael Bay film. And it wasn't just humans, or clones, that were in harm's way. During that climactic highway chase scene, a $600,000 camera was demolished when a vehicle slammed into a concrete barrier. Many shots for the chase sequence were captured using a camera vehicle dubbed the Bay Buster, which could crash into other cars at 60 miles an hour without harming crew or equipment. The idea for the highway chase came to Bay when he was driving behind a truck transporting huge train wheels, and he thought to himself, wow, that looks incredibly dangerous. It's no surprise that was a light bulb moment for the maestro of mayhem, inspiring one of the most insane chase sequences ever put on film. Bay even liked it so much he would repurpose some of the footage for Transformers Dark of the Moon. Bay found that making the island was challenging, as it was contrary to his more bombastic instincts. He wanted the pace to be a slower burn than his other films, so he forced himself to not have any big action pieces in the first act, and then open the floodgates for his trademark adrenaline frenzy. This is something critics noted, with many praising the first half of the movie as a nuanced look at the morality of cloning, with the second half filled with the expected pyrotechnic spectacle of a Michael Bay action movie. The director admitted he had some doubts when they shot an early scene where McGregor and Johansson approach a destroyed building in dirty white tracksuits. He thought, oh my god, this is a very funny sci-fi movie. How is this gonna work? But when Bay showed dailies to producer Steven Spielberg, Spielberg commented that McGregor resembled a young Harrison Ford, which boosted Bay's confidence level. Of course, it seems like no Michael Bay film is complete without an awkward romantic moment. But the island was a little different. On the day of her sex scene, Scarlett Johansson refused to leave her trailer. Bay assumed she had an issue with the scene as a whole, but when he visited her to discuss, he was surprised when she told him she hated the wardrobe for the scene and wanted to go nude. Bay had to explain that they were aiming for a PG-13 rating. The director would later describe Johansson as classy, feisty, and very daring. As Bay labored to realize his ambitious vision for the island, the budget had climbed past $120 million. I keep expecting to wake up. Bay is often criticized for his use of product placement, but he applies the money from those companies to help lower production costs in exchange for showcasing brands like Puma, Calvin Klein, Nokia, Ben & Jerry's, American Express, not to mention the vehicles, including Cadillac's concept car, and plenty of GMC and Mack trucks. 
but this wasn't making enough financial impact for DreamWorks, so Bay had to approach Warner Brothers to split the production cost in exchange for international distribution. There were plenty of complications during production on the island, including the sudden dismissal of the construction crew due to an accounting scandal, which meant that Bay had to rework the schedule around incomplete sets. Powerful California rainstorms and other unforeseen circumstances caused expensive filming delays. For the scene with McGregor and Steve Buscemi's character in the facility basement, Bay filmed at a Los Angeles power plant he thought was unused. But on the day they shot, LA had a severe power outage and tapped that plant for backup power, creating an overwhelming racket and an interior temperature of 110 degrees. The clock was ticking and the July release date was looming. Ewan McGregor wasn't available to travel to LA for critical reshoots and Bay had to remotely direct him in London using a local British crew. With post-production working on an accelerated timeline, some visual effects would not be completed before the opening, and scenes would have to be scrapped. And finished shots were not ready in time for use in advertisements. Even worse, when it did come time to market the film, no one really knew how. Was it a cerebral sci-fi film that questions the ethics of cloning? Was it a big summer popcorn action movie? DreamWorks went with option B, playing up the action with little revealed about the actual plot. The late stage marketing was a source of frustration and anxiety for Bay, who was disappointed in the promotional direction and complained that the poster made Johansson look like a porn star. The island opened in North America on July 22, 2005, and it bombed, pulling in less than $36 million, a fraction of Bay's previous releases. International box office was a different story, but unfortunately the combined $162 million worldwide total was no match for the film's high production budget. At the time of the movie's failure, heads of DreamWorks film department, Walter Parks and Laurie McDonald, put some of the blame on the lead actors, believing that McGregor and Johansson simply weren't big enough names to headline a film of that magnitude, even harshly saying they might be superstars of the future, but not the present. But in hindsight, many people, including Bay, have said the movie failed for two main reasons, the title and the marketing. Audiences were expecting to see an island in a movie called The Island, and yet, throughout the film's entire 136-minute runtime, it doesn't exist. Instead of visiting this fictional haven, characters are actually just going upstairs to have their vital organs removed. It's kind of like when parents tell children their ailing pet went to live on a farm upstate. Sorry, Baxter. Bay also felt the domestic marketing for the film really dropped the ball, resulting in the poor North American box office. A poll taken shortly after the movie came out indicated that the target audience had no idea it was even released. Bay thought the international marketing by Warner Brothers was far superior in selling the movie, and that was why it performed so much better overseas. Others have pointed out that the film was promoted as a completely original concept in a summer of remakes and reboots, but was actually more like a genetic combination of Logan's Run, George Orwell's 1984, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, and George Lucas's THX 1138. Yet the most striking similarities were to the 1979 B-movie thriller Parts the Clonus Horror, prompting the makers of that film to file a lawsuit against DreamWorks, alleging copyright infringement, citing over 100 points of similarity between the two films. DreamWorks attempted to have it thrown out of court, but a judge determined there was sufficient merit for the case to proceed. Ultimately, DreamWorks settled out of court for a reported seven figures. Since that box office disappointment, Michael Bay has continued to excel in his signature overkill with the massively lucrative Transformers franchise. And he makes no apologies for his films. Bay actually credits musicals like West Side Story as big inspirations in that you don't have to be tied to absolute reality to make an entertaining film, but can use form and style as a way to tell your stories. For the audiences that have propelled his output to nearly $9 billion in worldwide revenue, Bay's exaggerated style is a welcome form of high-octane entertainment. And still, even the most hardened Bay critic will look back at the first half of the island and see a story that asks some deep intellectual questions. Why is everyone wearing white all the time? It's impossible to keep clean. And they will realize that within Michael Bay is potential to make a film that wants the audience to do more than just turn off our brains and enjoy. One that makes us look inward at how we live our own lives. <sighs> and then Michael Bay will blow it all up. You still think there's an island? Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company, and we appreciate your support.